Well, good evening. It's uh, Saturday, June 26, a little bit after 6 p.m. I want to welcome you to our virtual vaccine workshop, and we also have a handful of folks in the audience, but it's really meant for those to be, uh, be able to get the information from home. My name is Sergio Gonzalez, and I am the city manager of the city of Azusa, and um, council has requested that we try to get as much information out there, and therefore staff work really hard to get a panel of, uh, of our peers in the uh, medical field, uh, also in public health, and a parent advocate. Uh, the goal of the forum is to share facts and hopefully we can dispel some myths and share the community resources that are available. Uh, to get us started, I'd like to welcome our mayor, Mayor Robert Gonzalez, who will do the welcome and also tell something about his private, uh, his personal experience with this. Mayor. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to be here uh, with you this evening. Uh, so the residents that are here and at home, thank you for, for tuning in. I would like to thank the panelists for being here uh, to discuss very important information, uh, to get the proper information to our residents. And as we go through this process regarding the vaccinations, uh, there's a lot of misinformation. And I think having the science of what the facts about the vaccinations are important. People still have their individual rights, and we understand that but at least get the proper information. Um, I appreciate Mickey and Sergio for allowing me to do the welcome, not only as the mayor, but as a survivor. Um, and they'd asked me to share my, my story. Um, so a lot of you know or don't know, uh, last November, um, I had tested positive for, for COVID-19. And I, I did everything that we were supposed to do social distanced, wore a mask, washed every every ten seconds in seemed like, and did all the all the necessary protocols that were expected of us, and I still got the, the virus. Um, don't know where I got it. I uh, just know that uh, I didn't feel well uh, around Thanksgiving, and we all know our bodies, and I felt achy and. But enough to where I didn't get the symptoms like everybody else got that was out there. Didn't I had my taste, had my smell, just kind of achy, and I'm like, well, probably something I can just tough out. And uh, as the week went by, uh, my wife uh, said, hey, you still don't look good. And I said, well, we're not supposed to go to emergency because they were jam-packed. And I understood a lot of the you know, PPEs and a lot of the, the frontline essential workers were overwhelmed at that time, and I didn't want to overburden them. And it was almost a fatal mistake uh, because five days later, as my wife made me go to emergency, and I, I bless her every day for that decision, uh, my oxygen level, my saturated oxygen level was, was in the low 70s. And I didn't even know. I thought I could breathe, thought it was normal, and I wasn't. And as the medical team said, hey, you, you are in serious condition, I didn't know that. And everybody has a different story. Everybody has a different diagnosis. Everybody is different. And I got as close as you can get to, to death as you can get, and I don't want to be overdramatic, um, I spent the next 36 days in two different hospitals, and the side effects of the COVID-19, uh, they, they still don't know uh, the full effects of what I'm going to have to go through. Uh, my lungs are not 100% uh, clear, and this is seven months later. My voice, as you can hear, is uh, probably damaged for, for a while, at least maybe forever. And if that's my souvenir, from this learning lesson, then, then I'm okay with that. I'm alive. Um, I contracted what they call ARDS, and that's a side effect of the COVID. And uh, if anybody has gone through that particular process of having uh, acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome, um, I don't recommend getting that um, because that, yeah, as I'm understanding, is some 
looking what my process was, it was supposed to be fatal. Um, so I guess the lesson learned is, is listen to your body, get the science of things in front of you before you make those decisions. I didn't want to be intubated. Folks around me said, don't get intubated. Um, and I had a 50-50 chance at that point, and I'm, I'm glad I made the decision to do it because I'm here today. Um, but with the vaccinations that are you know, being put out, this will help you. This will help you not go through what I went through. And if it doesn't stop the, the idea, you're, you're, unfortunately COVID-19 will still be out there, but this minimizes the chances of the severity of the disease and I just wanted to share this with the panel, and, and my city manager's probably heard it a thousand times, so here's a thousand and one. But folks at home that don't know my story, um, I wanted to share with you uh, that it is important to get the vaccination. At the very minimum, get the correct information about it and have the discussion with family. And, and don't be me. Don't be stubborn. Listen to your body. Listen to your loved ones. Listen to the science. Uh, with that, I want to thank you again for being here. Thank you here and at home. And please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, um, but thank you again. Thank you, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. What a great story. And thank you for being with us this evening. Um, to get going with the forum, we're going to start with our first panelist. Uh, we're very lucky to have a great relationship with our health department. And we have a, a great uh, champion here in the city of Azusa that works with us closely. Our first speaker is Noel Bazzini Barakat. She is the Regional Health Officer for Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. Uh, and this specifically uh, designated for service planning area number three, which is the very diverse San Gabriel Valley. This is an area of nearly two million residents, including 45 cities and unincorporated areas. Noel has over 25 years of experience in public health and serves on on the serves on the provides leadership in so many ways, including the Healthy San Gabriel Valley Steering Committee and advises our own All In for Azusa initiative. Noel, welcome and look forward to your presentation. Turn on my mic. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me here and uh, inviting me. I'm Honored to be here with you all. And Mayor Gonzalez, thank you for sharing your story. I don't think there's anything I can say that would speak um, more profoundly to folks listening than to hear your testimony and the importance of getting vaccinated and um, all that you experienced. So thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. I'm really um, honored to be here with you all. Um, appreciate all the proactive work the city is doing and um, look forward to tonight to sharing some recommendations and um, some work that's going on and talking with you all more. I'd like to give you an update, some reasons why people are still not vaccinated and steps we're taking to address them. The importance of getting vaccinated and really the importance when there are still members of our community that can't get vaccinated, such as children under the age of 12, um, how important it is for each of us to take some steps to make sure we're protecting those around us. This slide gives you a little bit of um, information around the vaccination rates in Azusa. Uh, we, we do have over, in, in the county of Los Angeles, we do have over 10 million vaccines administered and um, close to 58% of the um, uh, the county residents are fully vaccinated. In the city of Azusa, um, those numbers are really aligned with that. And we are happy to see oh, over 23,000 people in the city of Azusa vaccinated. Um, and uh, the seniors in the city of Azusa, we have over 83% of the seniors in the city of Azusa vaccinated. So really incredible work, um, but we can do more. We really want to see the overall populations get at 80% 80, uh, 80 or higher. And the youth um, uh, populations um, really are only at 36% right now in the city of Azusa. So it's still a lot of work we can do collectively to improve the vaccination rates. The next slide, thanks. 
There may be some impeding issues around why people aren't getting vaccinated. So we really wanted to make sure you knew the resources that are available. For some people, it's still too hard to, it might still be too hard to get to a site and get vaccinated. Um, they may, there may be transportation issues. We do have free Uber and Lyft voucher rides available for people. Um, and if you don't have the app and um, you want to be able to speak with someone, you can call the call center and the numbers on your screen right now. That call center is open seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. It will also support people who are homebound and who are limited and unable to leave their home. Um, and a, a vaccination team will go to someone's home. So if uh, there really should be no barriers to getting vaccinated. Um, there may be some, yep, go ahead to that next slide. Thank you, you're reading my mind. <laughs> there may be some um, other reasons um, that uh, people may still have access issues. So we really wanted to make sure that folks knew that there are over 700 sites across LA County that are offering vaccinations. Our website um, at Vaccinate LA will give you more information and really has a user-friendly um, system. So you can type in um, a zip code, you can type in the type of vaccine you want and um, uh, the location, the day of the week, the time based on your work schedule and personal life schedules and um, different vaccinations will pop up. Also, again, our call center um, will be able to provide all those resources for you as well. Some other issues we had um, to pay attention to are that people need information and need to have access to the information so they can make the decision and feel good about a decision of whether to get vaccinated or not. Our job at public health is not to um, require that, but to give as much information and recommendations as we can so that the public can make a, a safe and effective decision for themselves and their families. Um, this is why we're having um, town hall meetings. We are coming and speaking at events like this as much as we can. And we do have a um, large number of community health workers, peer promoters that are out in the communities and providing information to, an to, provide, to answer any questions community member members may have. Next slide. Although we're in a pretty good place right now, we really do need to be mindful um, that the virus has not become less lethal with increased circulation of the Delta variant and the lifting of most public health safety measures around distancing and infection control. Unvaccinated people, including the 1.4 million children that are out there under the age of 12 who are not eligible to get vaccinated yet, really remain at risk. Um, while children are less likely than older adults to suffer the most severe outcomes of the infection, they are still really vulnerable with the illness and can become quite ill. We've already had over 156,000 children who have been hospitalized due to COVID, so they are not immune and they can get very sick with the infection, with the virus. Um, currently, we have over 36 children that are hospitalized right now because of COVID even with the numbers being as low as they are. Our strategy really to protecting these younger children is to get as many people who are eligible in the households vaccinated as the adults and those that can get vaccinated in the household do get vaccinated. They create a buffer and a barrier for that child to help protect that child from getting infected. If you do have a child in your family and want to get vaccinated, there are also some incentive programs. Um, right now, child care provider Kinder Care is offering caregivers a free day of child care to help them go and get vaccinated. Um, and this is available through next week. So we really encourage people to take advantage of this, um, what is being called a dose uh, of care. And you can find more information about that on that website that's posted on the slide. Next slide. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the Delta variant. Um, it's called the, uh, it, it 
there are various variants of concern, but this one is the one that's really, really of um, special concern to us right now. Where there are pockets of unvaccinated individuals, these variants can really spread and grow very quickly. Um, like all viruses, the viruses that causes COVID-19 changes constantly through mutation. Um, when a virus differs by one or mu more mutations from other circulating viruses, that virus is described as a variant. And the more transmission there is of the virus, the more mutation there will be. And some of these mutations will really end up being variants of concern, like the Delta virus. They can be more infectious, cause more cases, and be more severe and cause more death. Of late, we've been watching particularly this Delta variant, um, formerly known um, as the variant that was causing the Indian um, at pandemic and rise in cases there. Um, and it is, we're seeing it to be highly transmissible and it is much more contagious even to those who are um, vaccinated. It's also thought that it may cause more severe infection in people who do get it. And while we do see that those that are fully vaccinated are protected and appear to be well protected, those we're still looking at the data to see how it's affecting those that have only received one of their doses. So we do encourage you who, those of you who've gotten one dose but not your second dose um, to go and get your second dose for the Pfizer or Moderna um, vaccines. Between late April and early June in LA County, we have identified 64 cases with this variant. So it is something we're really looking at right now. Next slide. To stay um, in a good place as things are opening, we have three main recommendations for everyone in LA County, um, and really three things we hope everyone will focus on. First, we want to continue to encourage everyone who hasn't yet, who can and is eligible and able to get vaccinated, to get vaccinated. We have a lot of information on our website. We encourage you to um, go to it, ask questions in forums like this so we can help answer your questions. Call our call center. Um, we do also, in addition to those 700 plus sites, every week we have over 200 mobile sites throughout LA County that will do pop-up sites. And you can find out more about those on our website too. Next slide. The, the next thing we really hope people will focus on is wearing a mask. It still is really important to wear a mask. We know there's a lot of information out there and the mask requirements have been restrict, uh, lifted in many places, but we do really still encourage people to wear a mask around people that are um, unvaccinated um, outside their household, especially in crowded situations, indoor and outdoor. And um, given that capacity limits and distancing requirements are lifted and you're seeing more people in crowded places, we really encourage people to continue to wear masks um, when they're around anyone that might be unvaccinated. And oftentimes when we're, when we're in these crowded environments, we don't know who is vaccinated and who isn't. So we still encourage people to wear, vaccine, uh, wear their mask as much as possible. Next slide. And the third thing that we really want to encourage people is just to continue to um, practice those safe precautionary methods. Wear the mask, um, wash your hands, and stay home when you're sick. You can still get the virus, and we do hope that you, if you develop symptoms, you follow those precautions, you go get tested, make, find out if you are positive, and um, quarantine yourself so that, and isolate yourself so that others can't get vaccinated. Um, and our, in the worst of the pandemic, we were losing over 270 people a day. It really has been a devastating pandemic on our community. Um, 8,000 people were hospitalized. While the numbers have decreased, we are still today over 300 people had tested positive today. There are still people getting hospitalized. So whatever we can all do to continue to be careful, mindful, cautious, caring for one another and protecting each other, we really encourage you to do. Thank you so much for having me and I I'm, I'm really appreciate being here. It's the end of my presentation. 
Noel, thank you very much. Very informative and appreciate you being here with us. Our next speaker is Dr. Jack Chow. He's a Chief of Service for Family Medicine and a physician at Baldwin Park Kaiser Permanente. He also works with physician groups that champion the needs of patients, including the health care reform process for California and the nation. He received his medical degree from Keck School of Medicine of USC and is a big fan of the Trojan football team. He has received many awards for his service as a family physician, and we are pleased to have him here tonight to offer his expertise in examining how we can build more community confidence in COVID vaccines. Dr. Chow, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Sergio, and thank you for the city of Azusa for inviting me and inviting Kaiser Permanente to this forum. It's wonderful to uh, be able to spread this information because we really, really need to get everyone vaccinated. And I want to thank Mayor Gonzalez for sharing that story because, in part, you know, I was on the front lines all through this pandemic, and your story is not alone. I've dealt with many patients specifically, and I work in the hospital at Kaiser Baldwin Park, and we had that conversation that you shared amongst you and then your family members, that difficult decision about, you know, how to get help, when to get help, and whether or not you want to have the intubation and different treatment procedures. So we'll talk a little bit about the why we need to get vaccinated, and then, you know, it's right, is the vaccine safe and is it effective? We'll talk a little bit about the myths around um, the COVID vaccines, and hopefully we can, if you, that, if you got vaccinated, thank you for doing that. Thank you for your you know, service to the community. If you haven't, hopefully after this talk, you'll think about getting vaccinated. I know that today we're getting out, giving out Johnson & Johnson vaccine, so you still got some time to come down here, get that one single shot, and you get vaccinated in two weeks. And so with that, next slide, please. And so I mentioned um, a little bit about the why, and, and my why, my personal why, was that I saw how devastating this disease was. And I was one of the first in my medical center to get it, uh, to get the vaccine, not the disease, but the vaccine, because we did all we could, and many of my colleagues actually got the disease as well. And same thing with uh, our mayor, is that we did, you know, we, many folks in the front lines did all we could, washed our hands with our PPEs, masking, and some still got it. And, and, and just right around November-ish, that's when we saw the, the variant uh, the California variant. So we just talked about the Delta variant, which is the, you know, the former Indian variant. We actually had that in California, and it was called, it's, it's now called the Epsilon variant, and that variant was much more transmissible. Compared to about a year and a little bit ago, when COVID first hit, and I was talking uh, a little bit earlier about you know, last summer, you know, this is summer, we're coming up with July 4th, and last summer, if you remember, you know, the governor said, shut the beaches down, let's get, you know, be, you know, hunker down because we saw a rise. Well, at that time, when someone who got COVID and you follow the right protocols, many of my patients, their family didn't get it. But with the variant, this is highly transmissible, and that's what we saw in November. Many of my patients didn't know what happened. They were doing, you know, they were doing fine, and they were doing all the proper things, and then all of a sudden, one person, maybe a little bit sick, and decided to attend a family gathering in the backyard, or something happened, and everybody else got it. And, and so this, now, this COVID-19 has now changed so that these variants are much more transmissible. And they make some people really sick, as you heard the story of Mayor Gonzalez. You know, sometimes, yeah, you know, you, you hear stories about, oh, I'm tough, and, and I got a little cold, it kind of, it's like, it's like a little cold, and, and I was fine. But with every story like that, you have Mayor Gonzalez's story, and difficult discussions. And I've had, you know, patients, patients' families, patients' friends, and we talked a little bit about, you know, the devastating toll that, that this COVID so far had on, on the community, but those are real. We, I had patients who lost both of their grandparents, both of their parents. It is devastating. Young cousins who died. And so this disease is real and really makes some people sick. 
And by the way, it's really hard to diagnose. As a clinician at the beginning, you know, we didn't know if, it's flu, if it was flu, if it was COVID. And now, right, with the nice weather and some people have allergies, you have a little cough and you go, is this COVID? Because we still do have COVID around. And so some of these symptoms, just like Mayor was saying, you know, a little congestion, feeling tired, is this, you know, like the common cold that we're seeing? Because right now we are actually seeing a little bit of rise of what we call rhinovirus, which is a common cold virus. But how do you know that it's not COVID? And then, um, as uh, our public health officer, Noel, mentioned, you know, there is a lack of immunity. Right now, you know, think, you know, people, and we'll talk a little bit about herd immunity, but the herd that's immunized right now are the folks that are approved to get immune, immunization. So, you know, kids under 12, they're completely non-immune. And we have a small group of, you know, kids who unfortunately got COVID. And they may have some immunity, but it's not, you know, it's not in the general kids population. And lastly, we have limited treatment options. Obviously, you know, Mayor Gonzalez got well, and we'll talk a little bit about the consequences, but the truly, truly, we don't have many, many different treatment options. A lot of supportive care, intubation. We do have the uh, antibodies, um, if we can get to um, folks early. Um, but these are still under emergency use and they're not um, full, uh, fully authorized. Uh, they're not fully approved by the FDA, uh, but we are using them uh, as an emergency use. So next slide, please. And so, you know, all of these are reasons why you should get the vaccine. And, and like I said, if you are serving your community, many of my patients are frontline workers, retail, you know, the, our food industry, food servers, Never shut down. We, I have patients who are in the food packing industry. You are essential to our community. And by getting a vaccine, you are serving your community to make sure that we, California, and now that California reopened, that ensure that we can successfully continue to reopen. And so thank you for those of folks who got vaccine already, vaccinated already, but, but if you're not, Please, please, you know, as part of your service to your community, please get yourself vaccinated. And then we mentioned a little bit about protecting your family because if you, you know, and, and like I mentioned, you know, some grandparents died, some parents died. If you're young and you think you're healthy, still get yourself vaccinated because you may potentially still uh, pass that on to your loved ones. And then so your friends and, and your friends, if you hang out with your friends, you know, how do you know? Like I was, you know, we heard from Noel, how do you know? Now that you know there's no public requirements for masking, I don't know who comes you know into the restaurant, who who's vaccinated, who's not. I mean, I'm not going to go, and we're not police, right? And so we're not going to go up and say, "Are you vaccinated?" And that, and we don't want to put our entrepreneurs, and we don't want to put our servers at risk as well to contract the disease because they're part of our essential economy. And lastly, you really want to avoid what Mayor um, had experienced is that you don't want to get the disease. People think, well, maybe it's just a cold, I'll shrug it off. But you know, there are consequences. And so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, just in a second. But please, please, please encourage your community members, please, can, you know, your coworkers, your families and friends, if you qualify for these vaccines, if you're older than 12, please get yourself vaccinated. And especially kids, please tell your parents to be vaccinated. Next slide, please. And so. We'll talk a little bit about the disease process, and and when you know when you get COVID, like I mentioned, it's hard to diagnose. Sometimes you know, sometimes you'll get low-grade fever, a little bit of congestion. You go, mm, is this my allergies? This is a common cold. Some people may have a little bit of sore throat. Um, the, the the hallmark of the loss of taste and smell okay, doesn't occur in everybody. Okay, just like the mayor said, doesn't occur in everybody. Now, by the time you have shortness of breath, it's actually very often late symptom. And by then, your oxygen level is low, and you should really seek help. I know that there's some hesitancy about coming to the doctors, but call us, contact us. Uh, one of the benefits that we came through COVID was that we learned to do virtual visits in Kaiser Permanente. We have videos, and we have telephones, and, we, and so contact your healthcare provider, because we can give you that guidance. If you really need to go see the emergency room or come be hospitalized, you need to, okay? But call us, contact us. We're there for you. So don't be hesitant to to reach out. Most people will have symptoms uh, of short duration, but some after three or six weeks even more will continue to have symptoms. And some of these symptoms are commonly persistent shortness of breath, 
long-term cough, some raspy voice, difficulty you know, in, in exercise, and they, they feel tired, they, they're fatigued. Some people may have heart palpitations. This virus, what we know is it can you know, affect the heart, and many of the young folks who are hospitalized may die of sudden cardiac death because of their cardiac arrhythmias. Some people may have these, um, and, and part of, you know, I have patients who still are recovering from long COVID syndrome, and they have these weird muscle pains, you know, nerve pains that is very annoying, sometimes keeps people uh, at night, you know, waking up for, with pains, and, and it's, it's suffering. I mean, it's not easy, it's not easy. And then to talk about the psychological impact, we are now recognizing that this disease do, do cause anxieties and depression. Some people even manifest post-traumatic stress syndromes. And, and, and you know, you, you've heard about post-traumatic stress from people who are coming back from wars, but this is actually, uh, it, it, it's, it's very similar in, in terms of the psychiatric impact of this disease. And so it's not an easy thing to go through, and, and if people still have doubts you know, talk to some of these long callers. Please get yourself vaccinated. And, and, and you know, the, those folks who get, um, there's a study from the British Medical Journal that shows that the average age is actually young folks, 45 and older. Young, <laughs> young is, is about 45 and older. We don't tend to see uh, long haulers in, in the uh, adolescent and, and kids. And we don't usually see long haulers in folks who are older than 65. Is this highly productive age, many folks are in the front lines that are getting it. It's more commonly in women than men. And it's up to about 10% of all cases. So one in 10 may end up with the long haulers. So it's not as rare as you seem, okay? And so please, 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 you don't want to get that. Next slide, please. And so then we need to talk about, you know, well, I got patients who said, you know, I don't want to get the side effects. You know, I want, you know, I, I'd rather have the disease. I, if I don't convince you about the long haulers, okay, you know, the side effects, yes, I will tell you there are side effects. And this is what we call reactogenicity. When you get a vaccine, and then that's not just the COVID, you know, with flu shots too, every year I have the same uh, speech with my patients about side effects. They do occur. Now, most people will have some mild pain, a little bit of redness, a little bit of swelling. Some people may feel a little tired, a little headache, muscle aches. I will tell you, my first dose, the next day I woke up, you know, a little bit of headache. I had a little bit of pain, no redness, slight swelling, and kind of felt bad for about a day. And after that, I was fine, okay? And the side effects do vary by people, vary by age. And the most of the times, they usually last about three to five days, and they're over. Okay? Now, you do hear, and, and I want to address, uh, you know, there are adverse events. So I, there are difference between what we call side effects versus adverse events. Adverse events are complications from vaccines. And it's not just for COVID vaccine. We know flu shots. Other vaccines may have adverse events, polio shots. We know measles shots. So all of these may have adverse events, but these are rare. Okay? And I want to be honest with everybody. It's not that it's zero. And I tell patients, you know, hey, when the lottery hits a million, you know, hundred million dollars, I play too, right? Because it's, it's a, you know, it's, it, there is a chance that I could win. Well, there is a chance that potentially that someone can get an adver adverse event, but it's rare. I mean, it's rare that I win the lottery, right? And, and, and it's, and, but some people do win the lottery. Okay? So we have to be honest about that that there are adverse events. So as you heard about um, a, a few months back that there was some adverse event related to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, what we know is that there were 15 cases out of 7 million doses that were given about uh, lower, lowering platelets and had some blood clots in the brain. Okay, so we do warn people about that. Uh, the demographics is usually about young women around mid 40s and 30s. Uh, who will get this? If there are symptoms, you know, please let us know. Usually, there it happens within the first 15 days. And more recently, you heard about you know the the brain inflammation, okay, uh, from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, the CDC are keeping track, and so when you get vaccinated, uh, you'll get a card, and you can sign up for this VAERS website that's run by the CDC. And I I signed up too, and I get a, a text and I have to enter my symptoms. This is the way we 
are able to really look at adverse events and look at which ones are just common side effects and no big deal, but some are adverse events. So what we found is that you, especially younger adult, um, no, younger adolescent and adult males, ages 18 and up, that there seem to be some folks that may have a headache and that may have some inflammation called meningitis. It happened in about less than 1,000 cases of all of the 117 million doses given. And so the doctors are aware, and if you have any concerns, talk to your doctors because it's very important for us to you know, understand your concerns. And it's not you know, one or the other. We have three emergency use vaccines in the United States, and two are the, the what we call the modified RNA vaccines or mRNA vaccines, so that's Pfizer and Moderna, and then we have a, a virus, um, it's a viral-based um, vaccine called Johnson & Johnson, it's a single dose. So you have options. Talk to your physicians about these options. Um, next one, please. And so, especially, you know, and I, I get these uh, questions from patients too, uh, and so I want to mention a little bit about these special cases. Um, first of all, uh, if you ever had had COVID-19 infection and you recover from it, I still recommend for you to get the vaccine. And, and the reason is this. Uh, I just, uh, we were just chit-chatting a little bit earlier, uh, but uh, I was reading a UCLA study. Um, there, uh, just a few days ago, UCLA published a study that showed that folks who had COVID vaccine or had COVID disease, when they received a, the first dose of the mRNA vaccine, their immune response is much more, it's boosted. Okay? Now the second dose did not actually increase their immune reactivity. Okay? And so it seemed that at least one booster shot okay, for folks who had had the disease does help. Okay? And so please, please, if you ever had been infected before, okay, and you think that my natural immunity will protect me, well, that's not so. Okay, so please get yourself that vaccine. The only caveat is this. If you, were, if you ever received the monoclonal antibody when you're during your hospitalization, then we recommend for you to wait 90 days because the monoclonal antibody, we're concerned that the monoclonal antibodies will suppress your own natural immune system against this vaccine. And so we recommend for you to wait three months. Now, um, the next special case is that some people are uh, concerned about allergies. And many people have different types of allergies. We have allergy seasons. And, and part of this is that the allergic response, usually, when people, if they're gonna get vaccine allergies, it usually occurs within the first uh, 15 minutes. And that's why we recommend for everyone to be waiting after you get your shot, uh, you wait about 15 minutes. Now, if you have particular allergy concerns, please let us know and we will observe you for a little bit longer. Every vaccine site will have health professionals with EpiPens and will be able to assess you. Uh, there, are only, there, are, there are two specific type of allerg allergies that you need to know, okay? So the first one is called a PEG, P-E-G, polyethylene glycol. This is commonly found in laxatives. If you're allergic to this PEG, P-E-G, then you should not get the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, okay? But you can still get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. On the other hand, if you're allergic to polysorbate 30, and this is sometimes found in food additives, and so if you're specifically, if your allergist, if your family doctor says, hey, you're allergic to this food additive, then you shouldn't get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, okay? But you can still get the Moderna and the Pfizer, the modified RNA vaccines. And these vaccines, just let, your, you know, let the vaccinators know that you may have allergies, but, and we'll just watch you a little longer, about 30 minutes. Um, there were some questions about, oh, can I get other vaccines? Well, right now we can. Uh, and and you know, I'm sure there will be questions about, well, are, are we gonna get boosters in the future? And, and we don't know that yet, but we'll see. But right now, you still can get and, and when the flu season comes, you can still get the flu shot, okay? Um, the only caveat right now is that we're not sure about some live virus vaccine. So for folks who are older, who may be wanting to think about getting the shingles vaccine, and the shingles vaccine is actually a live vaccine. And so, so we want to ask you to wait about uh, two weeks after that. And there are some special cases also for the immunocompromised and then people are on immune suppressants. Uh, folks who may be getting special injections for their uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, Crohn's disease, et cetera. 
Uh, there's some limited data. Uh, some people are actively are receiving uh, chemotherapy treatments, and so these are immunosuppression treatments. We ask you to follow up and talk to your healthcare providers, your rheumatologists, your gastroenterologists, your oncologists, to, more, to have more specific information about when is it appropriate to get your vaccines. But we still recommend for folks to get their vaccines. And lastly, with regards to pregnancy, breastfeeding, and infertility, you know, there are people who are concerned, and rightly so, about is it going to be safe for myself or if I'm going to be pregnant or if I'm going to be breastfeeding. Well, number one is this. We have studies of over 20,000 pregnant women, and there are data that shows that this vaccine is absolutely safe. And by, and by the way, this disease has been with us for more than nine months. So we have births on people who have had received the vaccines. And so it's absolutely safe for pregnancy. Uh, for breastfeeding too, we now know, and just like other vaccines, we now know that the antibodies do cross. So if you're breastfeeding, you're actually protecting your newborns from this condition. What we know now is that even we don't, we're not studying newborns for these vaccines. What you're hearing is that for the 12 and older for Pfizer, now I know Moderna is studying the, uh, uh, their vaccine in children, and we know that uh, Pfizer is studying down to about six months, uh, six months to 11 years old. So, so more studies will be coming for uh, younger children, but we're not studying kids that are under six months. And then so one of the best ways to protect your children, especially against diseases for newborns, is that to have the to have the mother vaccinated. Next slide, please. And I wanted to end um, the, my, my section of the talk by talking a little bit about the myths. And so number one thing is this. There are no trackers. I heard this over and over again. There are no metal parts. You know, there's some type of social media kind of swirl around Bill Gates funding the research and there's tracking. There is no tracking. Now, there are reporting requirements for vaccinators. We need to, you know, there's a state database, and now you can get actually a QR code. So if you've been vaccinated in the future, there may be venues where you need to have, you know, show proof. And so there are, the state can, in their database, they can actually look, at, look up uh, if you're vaccinated or not and provide you a, a code and so that you can use that uh, for, for California at least. Um, there are also myths about, you know, well, this, you know, these uh, vaccines contain aborted human tissue or it can alter human DNA. Well, these technology are not being used, okay? They're not studied on aborted fetal tissues. They do not alter human DNA. Well, these are, these technologies are using the RNA. And the RNA, I tell folks about social media, you know, some of you may be familiar with Snapchat, you know, getting a message and uh, afterwards it's read and it's done and it's gone. So that's what the modified RNA vaccines are. There are little messages that tells your cells to, to say, recognize this protein. After it's being made, it's gone, All right? So it doesn't retain, it's not retaining your body. And other things, you know, you know, people are afraid that, you know, I'm gonna get COVID from this vaccine. Well, you won't because this is not a complete RNA. It only looks at the spike protein, that presentation protein. And so, so there is not a complete virus. You will never get COVID from the vaccine. And then there are other um, folks who are maybe having some religious concerns uh, over the vaccine. And th these are absolutely you know, sanctioned by major religions. There are, all of the re major religions have came out saying there's no contraindication in, as a religious belief for these vaccines. So, so just bearing that in mind. And then these vaccines do not cause cancer. They don't change human DNA and they do not cause infertility because they do not go into the human DNA to change that. Okay. And like I mentioned, we have live births on people who had received vaccines, and these are absolutely safe from more than 20,000 pregnant women studied. So, so please, please, please do every, you know, from every effort you can, tell your communities, if you hadn't get vaccinated, please get yourself vaccinated because hand washing, face masking is good. And we're continuing that good habit. And I'm going to continue to wear my mask because it's a, it's a proper thing to do. It's, a respect, you know, it's my respect to you so that, because I don't know if you're vaccinated. It's my respect. I'm respecting your life by wearing a mask. But what you can do is you can respect everybody else by getting the shot. So that's the best way to go. And thank you.
for, for, for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chow, very informative. Next, we have Mayra Rico as a parent advocate. Mayra Rico has been a homeowner and resident of Azusa for the past 16 years. She has three daughters that attend Azusa Unified Schools where her involvement with the community began. She has had many years of serving on different school district committees as an active parent representative. She is a member of the Azusa Rotary, supports the two interact clubs at Azusa High School, is a, member, a board member of Azusa Leaders for Learning Education Foundation. She creates a positive impact in so many ways advocating for youth and families in Azusa. And in this past year, she even served on the AUSD COVID-19 compliance team, which advised the district on the school reopening plan. We're very lucky and happy to have a parent advocate, Mayra Rico. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, I would like you to know that um, I deeply care for our community. And um, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, as a parent, as a community member, you know, how what ex experience has been, right? And um, over the, the years, I've had the pleasure of getting to know many of you and uh, um, and to work with our schools and our city and the organizations that I that I work that I serve with, um, I primarily get to connect with parents and the youth of Azusa. When the pandemic began, like many of you, I felt confused and scared. Things were happening so fast; it felt like someone had hit the brakes really hard. Going to the store and not finding fresh milk or produce was unbelievable. On top of that, how could I comfort my children? when I was feeling overwhelmed with so much going on. I felt sad for all of the plans that we had for our youth that summer, but always understood that stopping everything was for the benefit of everyone. As we saw the numbers grow so quickly, it was clear that staying home was the safest for all. The transition wasn't easy for anyone, and our state and local leaders had to make quick and hard decisions. Seeing our schools close was the hardest for me. Some of the most serious issues that surfaced during the pandemic were the lack of food security, access to technology, and the internet for many of our students and their families. When I saw the response from our state and local officials, I was very happy. Our school district, with the support of many wonderful organizations that serve our area, quickly distributed Chromebooks and internet hotspots. They also made sure our families had, um, had food to feed their children by continuing to distrib distribute food through the shutdown. It was great to see the efforts from our representatives and our community members to feed so many people the, um, during the pandemic through contactless drive through food drives. Yet, we need to find equitable and permanent solutions for all of these issues. We are still in a world pandemic, so how can we work together to put an end to it? Herd immunity. It is very important that we reach herd immunity by vaccination. We have seen the effects of people getting the disease without their bodies having any antibodies to fight for them. We have already lost too many people and we will continue to lose people unnecessarily if we don't get vaccinated. For many, it may not be fatal, but they will live with side effects for the rest of their lives. We have to remember that this vi virus has mutated and now even has different variants. Studies have shown that the vaccines will have, we have now will continue to protect us. Once you start putting names and faces to human beings we have lost, things begin to change. In my family, we lost my grandfather. He was 91 years old. We got the terrible news that he would not recover on Christmas Eve. He had more time to give. I think about our community members and their families. Many of them have lost parents, grandparents, spouses, aunts, uncles, the, and these losses are devastating. Many lost the main provider for their home. And on top of the grief, they're also worrying about a roof over their head. If you find yourself questioning the safety or why they came up with the vaccine so fast, find out the truth for yourself. Don't allow anyone to plant seeds of fear in your mind or in your heart. I trust medical professionals. Yet, when talking to my kids about the vaccine, I found we still had questions. So we researched how are vaccines made? Who makes them? How do they know how to make one? And let me tell you that we were amazed by the advancement and knowledge in the medical and scientific fields. We learned that there are scientists that have dedicated their entire careers to research coronaviruses. We found out that all the side effects that we hate so much, like the fever, chills, headaches, 
meant that our immune systems are working and that they are hard at work. We learned about many different universities trying to come up with the vaccine and how not all were successful. We learned about the human trials, how some very brave people tested these vaccines, how they were all injected with different amounts to see what was the right dose to administer. They did this for the benefit of all of us. I think about our students in Azusa Unified, the ones attending the medical pathways at Gladstone High, about our Azusa High students that have had internships in laboratories. In a few years, they will be professionals conducting the research on these deadly viruses. They will be our doctors, our nurses. They will be the experts leading us. We are so proud of their decision to stick with this career. We encourage them to go to college, to follow their dreams, to go out there and make a difference. I cannot imagine them coming back in 10 years, professionals trying to explain to us that a vaccine is safe for us and will potentially save our lives and us saying to them, no, we don't believe you, you're wrong. Think about that. Sadly, that this is what some professionals are facing today. Once you have done your research without any influence of media, politics, or people that are not experts in the field, don't be afraid. I understand a lot of you want to, we want to wait and see what happens, how other people react to the vaccine. And let me tell you, everyone's experience will be different. In our home, four people got vaccinated and all four of us had different experiences. Do it now before it's too late. As everything reopens, as travel resumes, you will be exposed and at a greater risk of contracting COVID-19 or a variant. Look at the numbers. We're still getting reports from the LA County Department of Public Health daily. Um, and I see numbers go up, a little bit up every day. And the majority of people that are getting sick are people that are not vaccinated. I hope that all this information has helped many of you make a decision. If you wanna get vaccinated, there are many resources at our hands. Um, the resources that you can use to uh, help uh, find a place that, where vaccinations are available, you can go to myturncalifornia.gov or call 833-422-4255. You can call our local pharmacies. Many are distributing the vaccine. You can call 211 or visit 211la.org. If you're on social media, follow our city social media. Follow our school district social media. They have a lot of information on there. Follow our high school social media. Um, Azusa High School is a community school and has two representatives from LACO that focus on bringing resources to our community. So if you go on their, on their Facebook page or Instagram there, they always have a lot of good information. I have found so much inf useful information and have been able to refer other community members that have successfully found what they needed. Remember, anyone 12 years of age and older can get the vaccine. No medical insurance is required and you will not be asked about your immigration status. And once you have decided to get the vaccine, please share the knowledge. Sometimes people react better to certain information when it comes from people they trust. Our community is deeply cared for. The amount of support that we have is impressive. I wouldn't be sitting here today if I didn't feel this in my heart. And, um, and if you haven't received your vaccine, please um, come out. Tonight, you know, we, we have the clinic outside and you still have time to come out and, and receive your vaccine. Um, uh, so thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Myra, very powerful and very informative. Thank you so much. I think we have a few minutes for some questions, Q&A. Um, and uh, this is gonna be probably an obvious one uh, for uh, Myra or Noel. Is the vaccine going to be part of mandated vaccinations for schools? I think the parents would wanna know. So the answer? Well, Azusa Unified hasn't made a decision on, on this yet. Yeah, this is really um, something at the state level um, that a decision's made on. So we are um, uh, watching and waiting. And right now, while the vaccine is with um, EUA authority, there's still some work to be done there. But, but I do think um, in the meantime, we do just highly encourage people who can to get vaccinated. The children under 12 at schools won't be able to yet, so anybody else that is interacting with those students, the more um, adults and other students that can get vaccinated do, um, will create a greater safety net and protection for those that can't. Thank you, Noel. Dr. Chow, if most people are around, around me are vaccinated, what, what, do I still need to get it? Yeah, so you, this is about herd immunity. You know, Myra did mention about 
herd immunity. And then, and so what herd immunity means is that, you know, if everybody else is vaccinated, uh, you know, the chance of me getting the disease is lower. Now that's kind of tricky because if you really look at yeah, Noel's presentation, we only are not, you know, the fully vaccinated, I mean, the, the data shows 58% that's at least one dose or 80% for folks who are older than 65. Well, well so, so folks who are older than 65, yes, maybe they have her immunity, but then does that mean that they can't see their grandchildren who are not immunized? So, so that's a very complicated question. The issue here is this, is that we know the kids who are under 12 cannot currently get vaccinated. So their herd is not immune. And so there's no way for us to get to that herd immunity until everybody is getting, the, who got gotten the virus, who can get, uh, who, who can get the vaccines, who got vaccinated. And so, so yes, please get yourself vaccinated because there's a chance that even though people around you are vaccinated and you're out there, you may, you know, you may still get it back. And what we know is this, also, even if you got vaccinated, right, and you know, there are still some breakthroughs, you know, I just want to be honest with folks, is that you know, this is not like a, you know, a shield, you know, I, I'm the Avenger, I got the vaccine, I'm, I have superpowers, it's not, okay? But what we know is this, vaccines do save lives. Every of uh, the three approved vaccines, you're 100% protected against death. You're not gonna die from it. Very few people who got it are asymptomatic meaning that they got it, but they can still pass the virus on to other people, even if they're vaccinated. Very small percentage of these, and there's a Israeli study that shows 97% of those who got uh, vaccinated um, and uh, did not get symptomatic disease. That means that three out of 100 who got vaccinated with this, um, the Pfizer vaccine in this study, uh, who got uh, COVID had some mild symptoms, but none of them died, okay? And that's the take home story please get yourself vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Noel, question for you. Um, the vaccine is not yet available for kids under 12. Uh, if I may uh, work, and if I work with kids under 12, should I still be wearing a mask indoors and outdoors if I'm vaccinated? Um, yes, we do really encourage you to wear a mask when you're with people who aren't vaccinated. This is um, to protect those children and to also protect yourself, but we do really encourage you to continue to wear a mask when you're with anyone not vaccinated, including children under 12. Thank you. Myra, back to you. Are there any other resources or support that schools can provide? Yes, uh, our, our schools are, they have many resources for our families. Uh, again, I would urge you to go on to our Azusa Unified School District website, uh, to our schools, we schools websites, or even um, their, even their um, social media pages. They're full of resources. And there's even presentations that you can see that were pre-recorded uh, to get more information on anything. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chow and Noel, this is our last question. And I think it's really uh, common right now when people are wondering, will we need boosters? I'll, I'll take that one first, uh, and Noel can kind of jump in. Um, are we going to need boosters? We don't know yet, uh, and, and that's the honest truth. Uh, like I mentioned, the UCLA study, uh, they also published that, because um, they did the study in people who um, got the COVID and then get, got um, the mRNA shots, and they were able to track the, their immune response. And it appears that over time there is a gradual reduction of the immune response. Now, a lot of this will also depend on the number of people who are vaccinated and are we able to reach herd immunity worldwide. And this is the key, worldwide, because as Noel mentioned, when people are not vaccinated and the virus is allowed to replicate, there's going to be more and more variants. Just a little clue, there's right now a new variant called the Lambda variant from Peru. And so we don't know if the, the Lambda variant is going to be coming to the United States. And so if we are not there yet and that our immune system wanes, the science may tell us that we need to get a booster shot. So right now, we don't know yet. 
Yep, I, I ditto that, echo that. Um, and uh, really, a booster is a booster for people who've already been vaccinated. So get your first vaccine. <laughs> That's the main message. We, In order to get the booster, we do want you to be vaccinated. So do right now take advantage of the vaccines that are there um, to protect yourself and, and those loved ones around you. This uh, gets us to the um, conclusion of our vaccine workshop, but I wanted to give each panelist um, a 30 second um, message that you'd like to leave our residents of Azusa with as we are looking to have representation from many different areas, public health, a, a physician and a parent advocate. I think it's important that we try to reach as many Azusans as possible. So I'll start with Myra, um, our parent advocate. I think it's an important area where we need to educate our parents and making sure that they get vaccinated as well as their their kids. Uh, would you like to um, wrap up with your message? Sure. Um, my message would be to get vaccinated, continue to be cautious. You know, we heard uh, from experts today and, um, and, and let's do our part. If we want to see our community go back to normal, our schools to reopen and for all of us to be safe, uh, the best will be for us to get vaccinated and develop the herd immunity in Azusa. Thank you. Dr. Chow, your final words. Well, thank you, and on behalf of Kaiser Permanente, we thank you know the city of Azusa for inviting us to be able to share these knowledge uh, with folks. And I, I understand there are vaccine hesitancies. I have many patients who are asking me questions. If you have any questions, reach out to your healthcare providers, your doctors, uh, and hopefully we can share those information with you. But the, main, the most important thing is think about the why. I got my vaccine because I want to protect my families. I have you know, twin 14-year-olds, and they got their vaccine because now they qualify for it. They got their vaccine because they want to see their friends again, and they can go back to school. My 12-year or my 11-year-old, who will turn 12 in February, wants to get his vaccine but can't. But he wants to see his friends too. So the why is very important. So please, 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 and your why may be different than anybody else, but please get yourself vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Tell. Noel. Thank you. Um, it has been a, a long 16 months, and I know it's been hard for all of us as communities, um, seeing and knowing um, loved ones who have uh, been infected, who may have passed away. It has been really hard. Um, I do uh, feel like we as a community have done a really, really strong uh, um, job of protecting ourselves, protecting one another. And I just want to say, let's stay vigilant. It's not over. The virus is still out there. Um, and the variants are concerning us. Please continue to wear your mask where you can. Um, get vaccinated and be mindful of your symptoms and um, get tested if you have symptoms and do isolate yourself. Let's keep uh, staying vigilant and being really careful to care for one another. Thank you. On behalf of the City Council of the City of Azusa, I want to thank the panelists for being with us this evening. Um, it's a very important message. The City Council feels uh, that it be paramount that we continue to educate our residents and make vaccines available in any way we can. Uh, we encourage our residents to visit myturn.ca.gov uh, for other clinics. I know our city staff, I uh, want to thank specifically Mickey Carpenter and her staff and community resources for continuing to be creative on how we provide vaccines, whether it be at the drive-in uh, theaters, um, at local parks. Uh, tonight, this evening, if you are listening at home, watching at home, you can still come down to our City Hall and uh, get the vaccine, the one dose vaccine up until 8 p.m. Our partner, East Valley Community Health Center, uh, has been a great partner in this, is making those vaccines available. Um, also to this evening, we are gonna be hosting a visual. Uh, Mayor Gonzalez told us, uh, talked to us about his personal story and he wants to invite all our residents to come and, and say, hopefully we turn the page on this, back, this pandemic and we, we wanna pay uh, respect to those we've lost to the pandemic, but um, again, on behalf of the city of Azusa, thank you so much for being with us this evening and uh, our, our residents and our business community. We can only get to a complete reopening once we get uh, as many people as we can vaccinated. So thank you so much. <laughs>